Welcome to Geography 485 585L, Module 3, GIS and Services Oriented Architectures. Today we will be discussing a number of concepts related to geographic information systems, particularly focusing on raster and vector data types as a refresher, and coordinate systems and in particular information about coordinate systems that you can that you need to know for performing coordinate transformation using some of the command line utilities that we will be looking at. We will also then start looking at services oriented architectures in the context of geographic information, starting with a historic context for the current network computing model that we're in, and then discuss uh, the components of a geospatial services-oriented architecture, and the interoperability standards that allow connectivity between those components. Starting with our discussion of geographic information system concepts, we will begin with vector data types, which, um, as you are already familiar, uh, represent phenomena that have specifically bounded locations and are typically represented by three primary geometry types, points, lines, or polygons, where those vector data typically include the geometries that are associated with the features in a data set and also the attributes associated with each one of those features. So as an example, you could think of a census data file as a vector data product that has, say, census tract or block group boundaries that are defined by as a polygon. And then there are a set of attributes associated with each geometry in that data set, representing uh, attributes such as population, income, and other, other values. Raster data, on the other hand, are frequently used to represent data that vary continuously um, across space. Um, elevation is one good model for that. Where typically raster data um, are often represented as data in a regular grid, where the grid spacing or the spacing between uh, essentially the measurements that are in the raster data set um, is defined in terms of the resolution or described in terms of the resolution of the of the raster uh, data set. So as an example, a 10 meter resolution digital elevation model includes values of elevation at 10 meter intervals as they vary continuously across space. So you could think of it as regular sampling or uh, summarization of values as they vary across space. Often, um, remote or rats, rat, raster data also um, are parts of collections that are repeated in their observations. So if you think of remote sensing data or aerial photography collections, those collections often represent repeated observations over the same place. And this is where knowledge of time and the ability to develop time series from raster data sets is a uh, useful uh, thing to think about and is one of the capabilities supported by some of the open standards and data representation models that we will be talking about in just a few minutes. So when we're talking about getting information about raster and vector data, we have two open source libraries that we will be working with that also form the foundation for many commercial and open source applications. And these are focused on either vector or raster data. So depending upon the nature of the data set that you're wanting to work with, you would choose one or the other um, to uh, be able to get information about these library, uh, about these data sets based on the libraries of the utilities based upon them. When you're dealing with vector data, you're going to want to use the OGR library and its associated utilities. 
when working with raster data, you're going to want to work with the Google library, which stands for Geospatial Data Abstraction Library. Um, so this is the first uh, consideration you need to use when wanting to use either Google or OGR to get information about the data that you're wanting to work with and determining whether those data are raster or vector data and based upon that determination figuring out whether you're going to use the utilities provided by Google or the utilities provided by OGR. Another key characteristic of geospatial data, particularly as we start working on the process of being able to publish your data later in the term, we also need to have a very solid understanding of coordinate reference systems and have some basic abilities to be able to convert from one coordinate reference system to another so that we can provide the necessary information about the data that we are generating or that we're wanting to share, but also for troubleshooting um, uh, issues that arise when uh, accessing remote data sets that may be in coordinate reference systems that are not directly supported by the tools that you're using. We can use the PROJ library and the utilities based upon that library to um, perform a wide variety of uh, coordinate transformations um, where essentially w the problem that we're trying to solve is one of converting locations from a three-dimensional oblate spherical coordinate system, which is essentially what, the, uh, what is used to represent the Earth, into a two-dimensional Cartesian coordinate system that you would be able to display on a map or on a computer screen. Specific coordinate systems and projections are defined for particular applications and uses, and as a result there are essentially a limitless number of potential coordinate transformations available, where each one represents a mathematical model for the transformation from a, that three-dimensional uh, oblate spherical coordinate system into a two-dimensional system or vice versa. So you're going to encounter a variety of, of data in a variety of projections where that information may be available through interrogation of the data set itself, say using the Google or OGR um, utilities, or it may be available through the metadata or documentation that are published by the data provider as a part of the information about that data set. Either way, you may very well find yourself in a position where you need to do calculations to um, determine uh, the uh, converted values between one coordinate reference system and another. One shorthand method for being able to um, label specific coordinate reference systems and their definitions is using what are called EPSG codes, which, um, which stand for the European Petroleum Survey Group. Um, and now that group has been uh, supplanted or replaced by the International Association of Oil and Gas Producers as the group that maintains this catalog of numeric codes that are used broadly in many desktop and online mapping systems as a shorthand to refer to specific projections or coordinate reference systems. You can access an online registry of the, the, these data through the link provided on the slide here and in the lecture notes. As I mentioned earlier, every map projection is defined essentially by a set of parameters that are used in a mathematical transformation from one system into another. And there are a number of resources that you can use to um, determine or figure out what the specific parameters are for a given projection that you're working with. First, we have the EPSG registry that um, is the uh, source for 
the, um, the definitions of the EPSG codes. And this can be useful if you already know the EPSG code for a projection that you're working with and you're wanting to then look up the parameters for it. Otherwise, their, their search interface isn't that great. Um, there's also a projection list provided as a part of the uh, GeoTIFF uh, group. And this is another one, if you're working with one of the commonly used projections, they have a relatively short list of projection names that you can select from the link provided here that will take you to a page that has the information about the projection parameters. I have found historically that the performance of their website is a little uneven and sometimes it takes a little time for uh, the pages to load. Finally, and this is the site that I actually find most useful for uh, tracking down the particular uh, characteristics and parameters for different projections, is spatialreference.org, this uh, third item on the, on the list here where it provides a decent search tool. It will actually um, you know, find projections based on either name or EPSG code. Um, it does include non-EPSG uh, projection information as well. So it has the ESRI projections as a part of their database. Is it in addition to other projections that don't necessarily have EPSG numbers that you, but you otherwise may encounter? So I would probably recommend as your first resource for trying to identify projection parameters for a given coordinate system that you're working with, that you start with spatialreference.org and then possibly go to the others if um, you need additional information or for some reason spatialreference.org isn't able to provide the information you need. So when you have the projection parameters for both the source and destination uh, coordinate system, you can then use the set of utilities that are, uh, that are installed as a part of the PROJ4 library um, to actually do the transformation calculations themselves. The two primary utilities that you would use are PROJ and CS to CS. Um, and I would actually recommend CS to CS as your initial utility to work with as um, it actually provides um, a more explicit model for doing the, um, the transformation. And it's actually just a little bit easier to understand conceptually in defining the, um, the, the transformation definition. Here we have an example of using CS to CS in two different ways to do uh, two different transformations. Starting on line one, we can see here a transformation using CS to CS where I'm defining the projection as a longitude latitude projection based on the WGS84 ellipse and based on the WGS84 datum. So this is the source uh, coordinate system that we're going to convert to. You can see the two here in the middle of this command. And then everything after that defines the coordinate system that we're going to convert to. So we can see here that the projection is a UTM projection for zone 13 based on the GRS-80 ellipse and based on the NAD-83 datum with the units in meters. So that is the complete definition of essentially the UTM Zone 13 um, uh, NAD-83 uh, coordinate reference system. After entering that information, I hit enter on my keyboard and I can then start um, entering the um, longitude and latitude values that I want to convert to UTM Zone 13 NAT 83. So you can see here, I've entered a pair of values separated by a space. 
of 106.75 west and 35 north. Both PROJ and CS to CS assume that you're entering your coordinates in XY order, or essentially east west first and then north south. So you need to keep that in mind because that's a common error when starting to work with this as we often think in latitude longitude. In this case, we're entering in longitude and latitude. After entering that value in, I hit return and I then receive the corresponding UTM easting and northing value. And those are those two values here. For our purposes, you can ignore the zero value that's provided as an additional output as a part of the, the um, project. If you want to enter more longitude latitude values, you can just keep typing them in and hitting enter. And then when you're done to exit the command, you just hold down the control key and hit C, which you can see represented here on the command. I was just talking about the use of EPSG codes as a shorthand for particular coordinates reference systems or uh, projections. CS to CS and PROJ support the use of EPSG codes as they actually have built into the program a database of EPSG codes and their corresponding uh, projection parameters. So as an alternative to entering the full projection parameter information as I did in the first example, I can instead use the CS to CS command and, in, and use the init option and then define the EPSG code of the source coordinate system, specify two to define that we're, what we're gonna be converting to, and then I can use a second init set to EPSG, the, the EPSG code for the destination coordinate reference system. And that will automatically read that information out of its database. So this will work as long as the EPSG code that you're using is a part of the database that was installed as a part of the PROJ4 library installation. So this is where reference to that remote sensing um, resource for um, or, or spatial reference resource for EPSG codes can be very handy for locating the EPSG code for a particular projection that you're interested in um, so that you can then use that as an alternative to typing in um, all of the information for a projection which may um, be somewhat prone to error. The rest of the entry process in terms of entering your longitude latitude value and then getting back the corresponding UTM coordinates is exactly the same. As an illustration of the reverse process, we can trans we can in this next example use CS to CS to convert from the UTM zone 13 NAD83 coordinate reference system to a longitude latitude WGS84 coordinate system by again entering first the easting and then the northing separated by a space and then you will receive back the corresponding longitude and latitude values. And just as we saw earlier, we can use this um, init and EPSG code model for being able to use the shorthand to access and define the projection parameters. In the last example here, we can see CS to CS where we're using the init function and the EPSG code for that UTM zone 13 NAT 83. And we're gonna be converting that to the, the coordinate reference system um, that corresponds to that WGS84 longitude latitude, which is EPSG4326. We enter the easting and the northing separated by a space, and then we receive back the corresponding longitude and latitude. It's a fairly straightforward process.
Let's now move on to our discussion of geospatial services oriented architectures. Starting with a bit of a historic overview, first looking at where we have come from in terms of the origins of electronic computers with ENIAC in 1946, which given, given its, its characteristic as really the first general purpose computer that was programmable but could not store programs and it certainly couldn't communicate with other systems, you could think of ENIAC in some respects as the first personal computer as it was pretty much focused on performing one task at a time in a particular uh, well-defined uh, program. Starting in the 1960s, as it was recognized that um, computing uh, power was both very valuable and very expensive, um, the concept of client-server computing, where there were large mainframe computers that terminals would connect to over a local network so that they could essentially share the resources of that mainframe computer to execute programs that were initiated through the terminals. Where in this case, the computing was performed by the server and the client was purely an interface for the user to um, enter information in and, and look at the results generated by the mainframe as it was transmitted over the, over the network. That client-server model was, um, was dominant uh, for quite a while, but then we had in the 1970s the, the, um, the uh, creation of this model of personal computers where with an increase in the ability to pack computing power into increasingly small devices, desktop computers became an alternative to mainframes as they could run a wide variety of operating systems and applications, and they didn't have to necessarily be shared among multiple people so that, that users could actually have a dedicated resource to do their, the work that they were doing. Um, even in the early days of personal computers though, um, some of these were actually in, interconnected to each other via a local network to some local server that did provide some shared resources, similar to what a mainframe, uh, the mainframe client server model did. So some personal computers were still parts of networks interacting with um, uh, local servers, but uh, in, in many cases they were totally freestanding systems. Since the 90s though, um, we've actually seen the, we started to see the emergence of the model that we currently find ourselves in, which is sort of an expansion of the uh, client server model combined with personal computers, where now we have a situation where um, personal computers are not just connecting over local networks to local resources, but the internet has actually allowed for the access um, to global resources. And the growth of this particular model based on the evolution of the, the interconnectivity between uh, computer systems, as you can see here, and actually interconnectivity between individual networks, and the adoption of key standards um, allowed for the growth of the internet. And that really expanded substantially um, over the past uh, decade or so, while during the, uh, the the mid to uh, to late 90s, it was growing but more slowly. As the availability of network connectivity um, increased and the available bandwidth and technologies increased, the number of users participating on the internet has grown substantially as you can see in the, this uh, plot on the, on the slide. So when we're talking about the network computing model uh, in the context of our work, but even more generically, we're really talking about components 
that are interacting with each other in some way. So we have to answer a couple of questions to really gain a better understanding of what do we mean by services-oriented architectures and what are the components and what are the models for them to interact with each other. When we're talking about geospatial services-oriented architectures, a common model that has emerged is sort of a general purpose three-tiered model where you have at the base a data tier where data are stored in systems that are optimized for those particular data. So they may be databases, they may be files, they may be spreadsheets, they may be documents of some sort. Whatever they are, the data tier focuses on the efficient management of those data. In the middle, we have a processing tier where you actually are able to access services that can act on data and produce products based upon those data, based on requests that are submitted to services running within that processing uh, tier. Finally, we have a client tier where the various users of data or services um, essentially um, exist out on the internet where they may be desktop applications, they may be um, uh, web-based applications, they may be uh, software running on servers that regularly update information. They can be any number of of, uh, of, of platforms that basically are developing ways of interacting with content in, in either the data or processing services tier or both. So we have a set of tiers, but now we need to think about the interactions between those tiers. And this is where the key uh, interoperability standards come into play. And we are going to be focusing particularly on the interoperability standards of, of the Open Geospatial Consortium, or OGC. And even more so, focusing on three standards for uh, the, basically the interaction between these tiers, which are Web Map Services, or WMS, Web Feature Services, WFS, and Web Coverage Services, WCS. And we will be talking about those in much more detail over the coming weeks. But you can see in the diagram that basically you can have WMS, WFS, and WCS providing connectivity between the data tier and processing services. And in some instances, they may provide somewhat direct access to the data tier to users and clients. Um, in many respects, WMF, WMS, WFS, and WCS could actually just be considered processing services in their own right. So um, they, they, sort, they can sort of bridge that gap between data and client applications. Another set of standards that are critical, especially when trying to understand the data that you're working with, or standard representations of services that you may be accessing are the geospatial metadata standards. We're not going to spend very much time in this class talking about the geospatial metadata standards, but you should certainly have these on your radar as you're trying to understand the data that you are interacting with that are provided by others or as you're producing data that you need to document for, so that others can understand what, you, what you've created. The key standards in the area of geospatial metadata are the ISO or International Standards Organization 19115 and a related set of standards relating to geospatial data and services. And then we also have the Federal Geospatial Data Committee or FGDC uh, content standard for digital geospatial uh, data. Um, 
which is a U.S. national standard, which is now in the process of essentially being replaced by ISO 19115, um, but it's a standard that you're likely to encounter. Finally, we have the internet standards themselves, the broader standards that really are the foundation for the internet, some of which you've already had a chance to work with in terms of HTML, or hypertext markup language, CSS, cascading style sheets, and JavaScript, um, an, an additional internet standard that we'll work with uh, some in our next, uh, next week's class is XML, or extensible markup language, which is essentially a structured model for being able to um, provide information that is both uh, machine readable and somewhat human readable. Other standards that you may encounter that we will not be working with in this class but are supported by some of the tools and standards that we're working with are the SOAP standard for the Simple Object Access Protocol and REST model or the Representation State Transformation where both of these essentially define methods for machines to communicate with each other over the internet in a general way so that they can submit structured requests and get back structured responses from remote systems and have a standard expectation of what those um, interactions are going to look like. So let's now talk about the components that participate in this services oriented architecture. First, as we talk about the data tier, you know, we can talk about database systems that are optimized for storing uh, primarily tabular data, though there are some emerging models for um, non-tabular uh, uh, data models in databases. Um, there is increasing support for uh, spatial data being stored in databases where you can store geometries and the attributes associated with them. One standard capability of many databases is that they use a standard language called structured query language for um, defining how you interact with those databases. So once you learn SQL, um, you're actually able to work with a wide variety of databases. And there are, um, there's broad support for interacting with data that are stored in databases from a lot of other applications and programming languages. So, you know, if you're working in a spreadsheet application or in statistical software or in geographic information systems, in many cases you have options for being able to interact with data stored on a remote database server or system. There are some instances, though, where databases aren't necessarily going to be your ideal choice. Um, in those cases, you might find yourself working with file-based data that are often stored in a file system of some sort. And um, in many cases, this is used when the particular data don't easily fit within a database structure. You know, this is an area where, um, say, binary data or raster data can potentially fall into this category. Though databases, as they are evolving, are continuing to develop additional capabilities for supporting a wide variety of data models within their databases and the ability to extract and structure information um, that would previously need to be put into file and maintained in file-based systems. But there are many instances where you may still encounter file-based data. And those can be in a wide variety of formats whether it's in XML or as ASCII text formatted in a variety of ways. Um, I've already talked about binary files generically. Uh, more specifically, you might have spreadsheets or word processing documents or some varieties of geospatial data that might be more efficiently managed as files as opposed to being stored in a database. Um, you may also encounter situations where uh, essentially there may be file-based data that are remotely accessible. So you may have a web address or an FTP address or service that you interact with to actually obtain data in the form of files. <laughs> 
When we talk about the processing tier and processing services, the generic definition is that processing services perform some sort of modifications on source data to generate new, new data products. And one of the characteristics that you will often find in processing services is that as they have uh, well-defined sort of input and output options and ways for um, interacting with them, you can, in some systems, chain processing services together to produce a workflow where you can actually take the output from one service and provide it as the input to another. Um, you can have a wide variety of processing services that may range from simple OGC services um, which might provide data visualization or data extraction or reformatting uh, capabilities to very complex data processing analysis and visualization. So, you know, you might think of a service as being able to extract a subset from a large data set based on uh, search criteria that you provide or generating a map from a collection of data or combining two different data products into a single vegetation product where you maybe you might provide a uh, mathematical combination and a classic example of that are vegetation indices that are that are determined from multiple bands of remote sensing uh, data or you might calculate statistical information and deliver the statistical summary these are all examples of types of processing services that you might encounter out there for being able to work with geospatial or other data and uh, provide products based upon those data. Finally, when we get into the client tier, as I described earlier, basically any system that, that accesses the services provided by either the processing or data tiers could be considered a client. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that clients may be manually operated by a human or they might actually be automatically executed by software systems. When we think about human operated clients, you know, we often think of web based applications or desktop applications such as GIS or statistical tools. When we're talking about machine clients, these are systems that are operating uh, some, sometimes somewhat autonomously where they um, have a regular, ske regularly scheduled process where they're perhaps retrieving data and, uh, and actually accessing data processing services to perform particular functions. Finally, Let's talk a little bit about the uh, interoperability standards and service interfaces that provide the linkages between these tiers. Where here we're going to focus on the Open Geospatial Consortium interoperability standards. When we talk about the op Open Geospatial Consortium or OGC standards, we're going to talk about two classes of standards here. We're going to talk about standards that relate to essentially accessing geospatial products. And we're also going to talk about standards that um, are more related to data and representation for geospatial data. When we're talking about access standards, there are three key standards that we will be working with here. The first is the Web Map Services Standard, or WMS. The second, the Web Feature Services Standard, or WFS. And the third is the Web Coverage Services Standard, or WCS. When we move into the data and representation standards, we're going to briefly talk about Geography Markup Language, or GML. And we're going to talk about KML, formerly known as Keyhole Markup Language. As we're talking about the access standards, this uh, illustration provides a summary of the different um, uh, focuses of the, uh, the three standards we're talking about, web map, web feature, and web coverage services. Where web map services 
focus, focus on the delivery of images of geospatial data, essentially pictures of data. Though they do provide the capability to do very basic feature extraction, feature information, um, and they, like all of these standards, can provide information about the services through the delivery of a capabilities document in the form of an XML file. And like the other services, can also provide an exception document if you submit an invalid request to the service. So the web map service may be based on a wide variety of data sets and data types. It may use file-based or geospatial database-based vector data. It may uh, provide access to raster-based data, or it may actually tap into remote geospatial data services um, as a backend, essentially as a client, feeding data into the web map service, where the web map service then provides visualization of data from those varied sources. As we talk about web feature services, the primary focus for web feature services is in the access to and delivery of vector-based data, where in contrast to web map services, web feature services actually deliver the data themselves, the geometries and their associated attributes. They can also d deliver information about the features, essentially metadata about the features, in addition to the XML capabilities document that describes the WFS service as a whole, also then delivering an exception document. Web feature services also provide capabilities for updating remote data sets. Um, and this is an optional capability that we will look at in more detail um, in the coming weeks. Finally, web coverage services, like web feature services, are focused on the delivery of data as opposed to pictures of data. But in this case, they are primarily used for delivering raster data. So you might receive from a web coverage service a geotiff as an example of a data file that you would get out of that. Web coverage services also provide uh, sort of two different levels of documentation or metadata. Um, the first high level information through the capabilities document and the second more detailed information about a specific coverage um, for any coverages that are available through the service. So this is sort of a two tiers of information that are available from a given uh, web cover service. And as with the other services, if you submit an incorrect request to a web cover service, you're going to receive an exception document. Here we see an example of a request that is submitted to a web map service. In this case, this is a get map request and the map image that is returned as a result of that request. When we're talking about web map services, you can submit a request to a web map server in two different ways. You can use the hypertext transfer protocol or HTTP get approach, get method, to submit this request, which is analogous to typing this request into the, ad the address bar of your web browser and hitting enter. And then, the, then that is all packaged up and sent off to the remote server and it then sends back the map image that corresp corresponds to your request. There is optional support for an HTTP POST request, which is more often used when you would be filling out a form or providing more detailed or lengthy information where essentially the, the, informa the, the request information is structured a little bit differently as it's sent to the remote server. We're going to concentrate here on the HTTP GET interactions with any of the services that we're working with. The three types of requests that you can make to a web map server 
are the get capabilities request, which is the key request that you would do to make to any of these services to get the information about that service, the capabilities of that service, the avail available, available information from that service. The get capabilities request is the key to your understanding of a service so that you can then properly form requests to that service. It is the get capabilities request that most mapping clients and other systems use to configure themselves to get the information they need to interact productively with those services. So we will be practicing in uh, retrieving and interpreting the get capabilities requests provided by a variety of uh, OGC servers. Once you understand the capabilities of a particular web map service, you can then compose a get map request, which does, as it sounds, submit a request and you retrieve back a map image that corresponds to the request you made. Finally, you can submit a get feature info request that consists of essentially an XY coordinate that you would like information about the features of a particular map image. So this is in many respects sort of a, a poor man's query for the attributes at a particular location in a map. When you're submitting these requests, you're essentially going to get two types of documents back. You're either going to get mapped data as a result of a get map request, or you're going to get an XML document back, either representing the capabilities of the service or the feature attributes as a result of a get feature info. And the default is also if you submit an invalid request that you would get an XML document telling you uh, something about the error that you generated. One key additional characteristic of the web map service that's optional for systems that are implementing it, but is incredibly valuable when you're working with some classes of data, is that the WMS standard includes support for time-based requests so that you can request information for particular times from collections of data as a part of your, um, your request to the system. Web feature services um, basically are required to support either the HTTP GET or HTTP POST request and like the other services have a GET capabilities request that will return the metadata for the service as a whole. Once you have that, that higher level information and knowledge about the service, you can get more detailed information about a particular feature type that is um, listed in that get capabilities XML file by submitting a describe feature type request where you'll get additional information about that, that particular feature type. The get feature and get feature with lock requests allow you to actually retrieve specific features, their geometries and associated attributes from the remote system. So this is what you would use if you actually wanted to get the data, either in your desktop application or potentially in a web application. The difference between these two requests is the get feature merely retrieves the data from the system where the get feature with lock actually allows for locking of that feature in anticipation of potentially you making some changes to it before sending it back to the system so that somebody else can't make changes to the same feature that you're changing. You can also submit a get GML object, which is another way to get the data from the system based on a particular set of request options. You could submit a lock feature request, which would actually then lock the feature so that others could not edit it. And then there's a transaction feature where request where you can actually then initiate the process of updating data in the system 
in the remote system um, based on changes you made on your local system. You're going to get a variety of data back, um, pretty much all of it in XML, uh, unless, uh, unless you request otherwise and, and that capability is, is advertised, um, where you're either going to get GML, the default and most commonly formatted or, or a supported format for uh, delivering the data. You're going to get an XML capabilities or describe feature type document. And the feature data are, as I said earlier, likely to be delivered also as XML using the GML um, standard. Web coverage services, or WCS, um, also support either the HTTP GET or HTTP POST, where in, in both the case of WFS and WCS, the GET capabilities request will indicate what they support. For the WCS, it supports three requests. The standard GET capabilities request, where you would get information about a particular service. Describe coverage, where you would get more detailed information about a particular coverage that is made available through the service. So you might have multiple coverages listed in the GET capabilities XML file that, that you get. You can get more detailed information about a particular coverage by using this describe coverage request. And then finally, based upon the information that you receive from both of those metadata requests, you can formulate a get coverage request to actually get the data itself, where you have options for spatial subsetting, um, format, uh, resampling, all sorts of uh, all sorts of options that would be relevant for the raster data that are typically the focus for WCS um, services. So what are you going to get back? You're going to get back geospatial data for the coverage as you request it in whatever format you request that is supported by the service, or you're going to get the metadata as an XML document for either the describe coverage or get capabilities request. And like WMS, WCS also supports uh, time-based requests. So you can actually obtain from a remote system a subset of data based on a particular um, time uh, that has been linked to those data, that, those data. Moving on to our data representation standards, we have geography markup language, which is a grammar of the extensible markup language standard for representing geospatial features and their attributes. It can be used generically for the representation of points, lines, and polygons and their attributes. Um, but it was designed to be extensible by particular communities so that more standardized geospatial products could be developed by those communities where those um, extensions allow for the validation of products by that community to make sure they adhere to those community standards. Um, and we will talk a little bit more about this in the coming weeks when we talk about XML and validation. Um, the key here is that um, GML at its, provides a foundation upon which Different communities can develop more specialized um, data models. One of the downsides of GML is that since it is based on XML, basically an, a text, ASCII text model, um, and the fact that geometries can be very complex, they can therefore be very large in size, making for large files that are slow to transfer over the internet. So GML um, is is a very good standard for exchanging data as it is free to implement and use for exchanging data, but the, there is often a cost associated with being able to transfer those data over the network. KML is another XML specification that in this case supports the com combination of encoding of geospatial data, those uh, geometries, 
and information about how they should be represented in viewers. So it's a hybrid of both a data model and a representation model in a single file format. It started as the underlying data model for Google Earth and was originally developed by Keyhole for their virtual Earth viewer before Google acquired it, but then became an OGC standard in 2008. And it also supports the linkage of data through um, either embedding it into the KML file itself or referencing data, external data sources through URLs. And this is where there's actually a, a, an area where you can integrate web map services into KML for the integration of map images that are rem remotely generated into KML files. And this is through what, um, what's described as parameterization within the KML standard that allows you to essentially provide the core information that's needed to interact with a remote web map service um, that then a, a, a client, a geospatial viewer can use to compose proper map requests to those remote web map services. There is also a simple model for uh, representing time as is linked to the data objects in a KML file. And some viewers, such as Google Earth, will actually recognize that time that is embedded in KML and provide interface elements, in the case of Google Earth, a time slider, to allow you to actually view those um, data objects as they change through time, hiding and showing them depending on where the time slider is. So these standards are all well and good, but if they weren't broadly implemented, it would not do much good. And the good news is that these standards are very widely implemented. As you can see that the current uh, WMS standard it actually has over almost 300 implementations, and the previous version has nearly 500 systems that have implemented it. WFS and WCS have a lower number of implementations, but there are still um, a fair number. And you can see KML and GML also have uh, relatively high implementation numbers uh, for the various versions of the standards as they've been developed. So the bottom line is that these are standards that are broadly adopted and may already be supported by the tools that you're using. If you're using a particular desktop geographic information system, it may already support any number of these standards and allow you to interact with remote systems or these um, interoperable data representations um, just by virtue of their support for these standards. In summary then, we can talk about the service specifications uh, for WMS, WFS, and WCS, where WMS really focuses on the visualization of geospatial data through what are relatively simple requests. So this is a way to be able to retrieve what can be very lightweight pictures of geospatial data that may actually be derived from very large data sets on the remote systems. In those circumstances, when we're needing the actual data values themselves, instead of just pictures of the data, we use WFS in the case of uh, vector geospatial data, or WCS in the case of raster data, to request those data from those remote systems based on the criteria that we specify as a part of the requests. And we will be going through those requests in somewhat more detail in the coming weeks. And we will also then be practicing interacting with some of these services, both from the command line and from desktop GIS applications. So you're going to have many opportunities to work with these data uh, services. The data and representation standards provide for standard methods for exchanging data either with or without representation information. So for GML, 
It's a base standard for vector data and vector geometries and their associated attributes. And KML providing the combination of the data and representation information and the ability to embed linkages to external data sets that is a very powerful model for being able to um, provide access through either remote files or local files to a wide variety of resources.